live listeners, really. All right, you guys haven't missed anything. I've just been talking about how you end up with fascism. Uh, sorry, high deaf people. I've, we do our best here at the show. We really do. You didn't miss much. You're fine. Um, the problem is we have three branches of government. Welcome aboard. We have three branches of government for a reason. And that reason is to make sure that democracy, or we actually have a, a constitutional republic, but we'll go with it. Democracy has the best chance of flourishing. Liberty, if you will, has the best chance of flourishing. I don't think we have any volume, Christelle. Under a system that has checks and balances within itself. I don't see a green light on that camp. When you take that away, it might not have one on that camp. When you take that away, then what you've done, they're called checks and balances for a reason. To prevent absolute power from coming and corrupting absolutely, as it's been said that it's done. It might be fine, don't worry. It's a new camera, guys. I'm appalled by it, and this is exactly why we need more NSA reform. And the debate in Washington now has unfortunately been going the other way, the senator urged, appearing on Fox News. Since the San Bernardino shooting, everyone is saying, oh, we need more surveillance of Americans, Paul added. In reality, what we need is more targeted surveillance, Paul declared. I'm not against surveillance. I'm not against it. I'm, but I am against indiscriminate surveillance. And also, this is not unusual, Paul added, explaining that the NSA has been trolling the communications of Americans when listening to foreign agents. It goes on that it emerged yesterday that the Obama administration took the decision to eavesdrop on foreign dignitaries while the president declared the surveillance programs were being curtailed. In other words, he told you and other world leaders, hey, we've overstepped our bounds, we've messed up, and we're sorry. As the communications of allies with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu were monitored, so were the interactions with U.S. members of Congress, as well as the American private interest groups. So let me explain to you what you have here. <coughs> what you have here is a classic, a classic layout of the road to tyranny. The street signs are up, and we're driving straight forward. If you are having a legal conversation as a congressman with someone in Israel, there are certain checks and balances that you have to do. You're not allowed to breach the Logan Act, which they do at the Bilderberg meeting, by the way. You're not allowed to breach the Logan Act. But Beyond that, you are protected from the other branches of government spying upon you. Well, if they're listening because they want to know what Benjamin Netanyahu is about to do illegally by spying in Israel, then what you're doing is limiting the checks and balances which have been put in place to keep us free as people. The, uh, do you understand? Am I talking into a camera for nothing, or are people understanding here? This is, this is the whole fundamental purpose of the Constitution. It, it's why we're Americans. I don't give a damn if you think black lives matter or all lives matter. We're Americans here. One unnamed U.S. official revealed the Wall Street Journal that the practice raised fears in an oh shit moment when the executive branch would be accused of spying on Congress. The Obama administration was wary of this and so simply allowed the NSA to decide what to share and what not to. We didn't say do it. The U.S. The US official said it. We didn't say don't do it. Well, this is what Rand says. This is why I like Rand more than Trump. It's an invasion of our privacy. We can see how it would stifle free speech if you are going to eavesdrop on our congressmen and that it might stifle what they say and who it is that they communicate with, Rand Paul warned. This is a big problem and it's a, not a new one and we absolutely need more controls on the NSA and more controls on our intelligence agency, the senator added. He 
He's a man. I'm telling you. He's the man. But he's like, what, 2%. Paul also spoke about the upcoming GOP debate, saying that he is confident that he will make the cut for the next debate. There was a national poll out this week that had me in fifth place. Only one point out of fourth place, he said, adding, I don't think it's fair to have artificial distraction, and he would like to keep Jeb, Chris Christie, John Kasich, and Carly Ferrione in it because he's concerned about fairness. I actually like more people in the debate. I don't have a problem with it. Um, I think it, I, I think that uh, the third parties should be allowed in the presidential debates, for instance. I think that as well. I don't think more voices is bad. Um, the two stories in a row here, rather disturbing news uh, regarding HIV. Prison, as I think that there should be, prison for HIV positive men who didn't warn three sexual partners. And if you think I'm talking about this one guy, I'm not. I have two stories here and I need you to trust me and simply listen to me. This is by Rudy Miller. Ricky Webster was a child of an HIV positive mother, but he still had a strong chance to thrive. It says he was raised by adoptive parents in Hunterton County who gave him the love, medical care, and moral upbringing that they felt would allow him to succeed despite his early setback. There's that word again. But the 26-year-old Wilson Burrow man threw away those opportunities when he repeatedly had unprotected sex with women who didn't know that he had the HIV virus. In other words, he just started bringing it out, or as Trump says, schlonging people and not telling them that he had the virus that causes AIDS, which in my opinion... I, if you cheat on someone today, it's almost a matter of attempted murder, depending on how you did it. Not that it makes it any better, regardless of how you do it. Um, Webster was sentenced to 33 to 66 months. Good. In prison, plus two years of probation. Good. For having sex with at least three times each with a Nazareth woman and two Eastern women this year, neglecting to tell them of his condition. This ranks among the most cowardly of human acts, Northampton County Senior Judge Leonard Zito told Webster. This was not only disrespectful, but it borders on the most heinous and deplorable acts. Again, this, we're not talking about genital warts here. We're talking about HIV. He wrote, on my part, it was stupid. For the victims, I would not intentionally try to hurt them. I would argue that if you're schlonging somebody when you're HIV positive, uh, you, you're trying to hurt them. And the reason that I'm bringing this up as such an important issue is here, the second story. Thefederalist.com Planned Parenthood says hiding... HIV, that would be the virus that causes age for you Usher fans, hiding HIV from sex partners is a right. What they're saying is you don't have to tell somebody if you have a history of manic depression. It's your right to keep it quiet. Well, then it must be your right to also not tell anybody if you're going to put your sexual organs with theirs and risk giving them a disease that is incurable. Oh yeah, you can live for years and years and years if you get the pills and your body happens to react well to it. Why don't you look up how many people the cocktail doesn't work for? And I'm not coming at you as a sexually moral person because I'm really not. But I'm sorry. I, I draw the line here. I can, I can only be so open-minded before my brain falls out. This is not a direction that we want to go in. And mark my words, the social justice warriors have sold you everything from gay marriage to fat being healthy. They are going to push and push and make it so that it's legal to not tell somebody if you are HIV positive. Are you? Is, is, is anybody at all hearing me here? Is this not one of the most important things you've ever heard? Because I think it matters a whole lot. If you have kids, I guarantee it matters. In a recent interview with Matt Lauer, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still fighting this, and I'll be over it in mere days. You've seen my vitamin regime. 
After Charlie Sheen disclosed that he is HIV positive and has been aware of his HIV status for approximately four years, since Sheen is well known as a sexual legacy and claims to have had sex with 5,000 women, as you see here on FactCam, Matt Lauer and the rest of humanity were understandably concerned that Sheen may have infected some of his many partners with HIV over the years. Lauer asked Sheen pointedly, have you since the time of your diagnosis? And he says with no exception, he's never hidden it from anyone. Well, let's listen to this. Would it surprise you to know that Planned Parenthood disagrees? International Planned Parenthood Federation, of which Planned Parenthood Federation of America is an official affiliate, maintains that it is a person's human right not to tell their sexual partners that they are HIV positive if they don't want to. Now, in the exchange with Lauer and Sheen, Sheen seemed to assume that it was very important that you would let someone know this. And I hope that he's telling the truth there. Well, the fact that I even have to try to explain this, do you understand the importance of the words that I am commenting on here? Go ahead, infect people, it says. It's all laid out in an International Planned Parenthood Federation booklet for HIV-positive youth entitled Happy, Healthy, and Hot. It says, quote, young people living with HIV have the right. Oh, they do. They have the right to decide if you'll ever die. They have the right to decide if, when, and how to disclose their HIV status. It continues, sharing your HIV status is called disclosure. Your decision about whether to disclose may change with different people and situations. Yeah, like if you're hoping to get laid that night, you just won't tell your sexual partner because you're feeling like your human rights matter more than that person's life on that given day. You know, you were horny, so it's fine, right? It's fine. You have the right to decide if, when, and how to disclose your HIV status. That is madness. If there's anybody listening to my voice that stands up for that, there's something seriously, seriously warped in your freaking head. In other words, Planned Parenthood thinks it's your human right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that sucks. Planned Parenthood thinks it's your human right to risk exposing other people to a potentially deadly disease without telling them. Most of the states in the Union disagree with Planned Parenthood, but how, how long will it take for that to change? Let me let you in on something. Do you realize that indiscretions in the past, such as Monica Lewinsky and Bill, the uh, <laughs> blowjob, do you realize that it changed the nature of sex in this country? And I don't really have a problem with sexual liberation have a problem with sex replacing love and sex being considered the be-all, end-all. If two people that are in love decide to play around, so be it. That's not what we've seen here. What we've seen is it's okay to cheat, it's okay to do anything you want with anybody you want regardless of who you hurt. And now, it's gone to the level of being allowed to hide that you have AIDS, that you have HIV. If that becomes the norm for one generation, let's say you and I think it's nuts, but they start teaching it to kids 10 years from now. When those kids grow up, it will be normal, and it will be normal not to tell people whether or not you have HIV. That's, that's what they want to be normal. What about criminal charges? In 35 states, if you or someone who is HIV, if you or someone who is HIV positive has sex with someone else without divulging it, you can be charged with a crime. And Sheen said he understands that. Well, good, because I think that's the exact way it needs to be. You are not allowed to give somebody a deadly disease without telling them that you have it. I don't care if it's AIDS or Ebola. Remember when Ebola broke out, people were sneaking into the country and we all condemned them? for literally caring more about their life than anyone else's life, but we at least said we understood where the panic came from, this has now reached a level where your sexual gratification matters more than whether or not the person you just had sex with lives or dies. 
I'm sorry. I don't bend that far, friends. I, I, I bend really, really far. I don't bend that far, and I never will. Fortunately for him, International Planned Parenthood Federation is working to change that. Happy, Healthy, and Hot explains some countries have laws that say people living with HIV must tell their sexual partners about the status before having sex, even if they use condoms or engage only in sexual activity with a low risk. Yeah, because, you know, low risk is fine. You might get HIV, so it's, it's very unlikely. So you don't need to know, right? It's just your life. It's just a little bit of death. These laws violate the rights of people living with HIV by forcing them to disclose this or face criminal charges. No, it guarantees <coughs> that they are not going to kill other people for the sake of getting a good lay. That's what it means. The pamphlet then gives tips to protect oneself from criminalization and does say that the best way to protect yourself, which is apparently more important than protecting your partner, is to tell your partner that you are infected. This section ends with the statement, get involved in advocacy to change the laws that violate your rights. In other words, your right to have a good lay is more important, according to Planned Parenthood, than the rights of the person that you sleep with to know. So, I mean, if you're gorgeous, just keep banging people. Give them all the, the diseases you want, right? This, friends, I'm dead serious. This is going to be a huge, huge problem if it is not addressed really fast and stopped in its tracks. I, I can't, I've said all I have to say. If, if it needs to be explained to you any other more, any more than that, then I, I, I don't know what to say. End of the American dream. 20 super wealthy individuals have more money than the poorest 152 million Americans combined. Did you hear that or did, did I just say it into the camera and you're, you're ticking on your phone and you're texting your friends trying to figure out whether you're going to get laid and whether or not the person has AIDS. Are you paying any attention? 20 people, 20 super wealthy individuals have more money than the poorest 152 million Americans combined. Michael Snyder writes, do we need any more evidence before we finally admit that the middle class in America is being systematically destroyed? Well, listen to this. The richest 20 Americans with a combined net worth of $732 billion are as wealthy as half of the U.S. population, according to a new study. Findings sickening ones, showed that the country's 20s, 20 wealthiest people, which includes Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, <coughs> now own more wealth than the bottom half of the population combined, which is, of course, 152 million people. 20 people. 20. The study by the Institute for Policy Studies also found that Americans' wealthiest 400, with a combined net worth of $2.34 trillion, own more wealth than the staggering 194 million people, which is the bottom 64% of the country. So you've got 20 people who have as much wealth as half the nation, and there are 400 people that are equal to the wealth of 61% of the nation. There, on fact cam, is uh, quite clearly what he's talking about. Listen to this. 38% of all American workers made less than $20,000 last year. 51% of all American workers made less than $30,000 last year. If you, made, if you made more than 30 grand last year, you're doing better than half the country. 62% of all American workers made less than $40,000 last year. And 71% of all American workers made less than $50,000 last year. And if you are extremely frugal, it says, you might be able to support a middle class family on fifty grand a year. But as you see, 71% of all American workers make less than that. So of course you have your wife or whatever work because you have to, but then what does that do to the family as a whole? You end up with Usher on the radio. You end up with... Uh, I'm in love with the go-go. You end up with brainless, idiot, boneheaded stuff when you do that. 
we're seeing the systematic destruction of our country, friends. If you can't see it, then I don't know how to make it more obvious. I've got a whole slew, a slew of stories to get to, so don't, don't go away. I just want to remind you, you can uh, support the show at the correct views of hotmail.com. Every penny you give to me goes towards a better show. Uh, the lights, the, the cameras, which we're still trying to sync properly, um, all of it. Also, you can look us up. Uh, I want to give you a shout-out, if you could, to change transportation. If you're within uh, about a 50-mile radius of Canton, Ohio, call Change Transportation, and you're going to get the best deal you've ever on a ride from point A to point B. And listen to this. This is brought to you here by Sticker Junkie. You can see it right here, StickerJunkie.com. What stickers do you want? Go ahead and order. Give them some idea what you want. Type in correct views in the promo code. You're going to save a bundle by letting them know you heard about it here. Express.co.uk. A miracle baby comes back from the dead. 30 minutes after life support was switched off. Now this story's gonna matter to some people that you wouldn't think it normally would apply to. There's the little angel there. It's published by Laura Holland. Um, my brother and I had the rather unhappy decision to make. My mother had sepsis and she beat it. A few months later, she got sepsis again, and we left her on life support. She had a pain response, which means if you poke her with a pin or tickle her feet or, you know, lightly tug her hair, she could tell you were there, but she couldn't communicate. We told her that we were giving her a little over two days on life support because the doctor said she wouldn't make it and her whole system was shutting down, and we gave her that weekend, and mom didn't win that one. We pulled the plug, we had to let her know we were pulling the plug, and we're pretty sure she was crying when we did it. Whether they were tears of joy or happiness, we do not know. Probably joy, because we were playing her favorite music and telling her that she was a great mother. There's been a part of me that wonders if whether or not that might have been a huge mistake because she had two days of pure hell. Well, this convinces me that we did the right thing. 18-month-old Bella Moore Williams' parents could only watch helplessly as their sedated daughter took what they thought would be her last breath. Mother Francesca, 41, and Father Lee, 44, wept and took... One last photograph of her brother Bobby, five, before her ventilator was switched off. They also made prints of her hands and her feet as a memento and invited family members to the hospital to say farewell. Doctors had told them three times that it was unlikely that she would survive after they diagnosed a genetic disease. Thirty minutes later, she began kicking and screaming. Mrs. Moore Williams said we had the whole family at our sides. On July 21st, we were, 21st, we were told to say goodbye, do our goodbyes, and the whole family came in one by one to say them. I just kept sitting there thinking, why us? It was my heart wrenching because you see family members cry that you've never seen cry before. I will never, ever forget that moment when I had to say goodbye to my daughter. Mr. Moore Williams said, he changed his name to Moore Williams? That's odd as hell. Mr. Moore Williams said, I was holding her hand knowing that there was going to be a little last breath. I couldn't feel her, I could feel her hand dropping and it went down, but then she started gripping my finger. She started moving on her own and then her machine started going off. The doctors then changed everything to try to keep her alive. The couple had filled out a form to say that no special measures should be taken to keep their daughter alive. However, after she started fighting for life again, the, the doctors decided to try and revive her. Well, how very white of them. Mr. Moore Williams, an account manager for a building firm, added the doctors changed their way of thinking, and they went in all the way to save her. In those 20 minutes, I realized that she simply wasn't letting go. Bella's oxygen levels shot back up to 100%, and later her parents were told that she would survive. So don't tell me miracles do not happen today. They do. <coughs> For those of you in this mic, I'm so sorry about this coughing. 
She will still be under treatment, but back home in Clanton, uh, Clacton on the Sea, Essex, with her boyfriend, with her, oh, excuse me, with her overjoyed family. They will celebrate Bella's second birthday next month. Mrs. Moore Williams, a sales supervisor, said it's just amazing. It's like we have won the lottery. So, you know what? If you feel like you want to give your loved one a fighting chance, you might want to go ahead and do so. It says uh, she could not sit up and properly and failed tests to find a reason. In July, her condition worsened and the doctor said it was likely mitochondrial disease in which the cells failed to produce enough energy. Well, Mrs. Moore Williams said she's now learning to talk and her hair is growing back. She's even walking. She's about eight months behind where she should be, but the doctors are confident that she will pick up quite quickly. We are excited to be together for Christmas and to sit back and watch them open their presents. Bella loves Father Christmas, so we can't wait to have Christmas, and we support, and we thought that we'd never have this six months ago. So God bless them, and uh, don't tell me miracles don't happen anymore, because you know what they do. Um, this is terrible. This is some of the absolute worst news I'm ever going to say on this show. Let me kill Mr. The Godfather, the creator of heavy metal. You could say the Elvis of heavy metal, or you could say the Little Richie of, of heavy metal, since actually Little Richard created rock and roll, it wasn't Elvis. You see that a lot. I mean, not to digress, but uh, Throbbing Gristle created industrial music, but it was Skinny Puppy that made it great. A few other bands. Front 242. Um, Einsters in der Neubauten, anyone? Uh, Eddie Van Halen created a, a style, but it was Randy Rhodes who perfected it. Um, of course, Little Richard created rock and roll. Elvis perfected it. Well, Lemmy found in heavy metal. Listen to this. This is really sad. Wait, look at this picture of him right there. That is Sebastian Bach of Skid Row holding up a, uh, a mask of what Lemmy usually looks like. Beside him is the real Lemmy. That, my friends, is a travesty. Wide eyes staring out above sunken cheeks. Motorhead frontman Lemmy looks a shadow of his hell-raising younger self in these two photographs taken just days before his death. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, that's what you get when you live a hard-rocking, heavy metal lifestyle. He drank a bottle of Jack Day, and that's what he gets. Well, okay, you could possibly say that, but he lived to 70. He toured as recently as this summer. I think he was touring in the fall. So, I mean, he didn't die particularly young. He outlived my dad by a year and my mom. In one image... Posted on Twitter by Sebastian Bach, frontman for the heavy metal band Skid Row, Lemmy is seen propped up against the bar. I'm just showing you that one there, obviously. It says the 70-year-old rocker with his two young female fans with another picture taken. And on Boxing Day, just 10 days after these images were shared online, <clears throat> Lemmy was told he had an aggressive cancer, though it was still not known what...